Hello, good evening. Good evening indeed. And welcome to a very special edition of Social Distancing Live tonight. At an earlier time, an earlier kickoff, I should say, of eight o'clock because we've got a very special guest, former Premier League footballer, Gavin Peacock, former BBC pundit and legend in my eyes. <laughs> Gavin Peacock is on the show tonight. I'm just going to introduce him in just a moment. But if you're wondering what's behind me tonight, of course, we've got the green screen here. Gavin won't be able to see this, but I've got the Cardiff City Stadium because they're my team. And I thought I'd get uh, get on the football theme tonight. But uh, I'd just like to say a big hello to Gavin Peacock. Hi, Gavin. How are you doing? Hi there, Rob. Yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. Good to, good to be with you this evening. Great, thank you so so much to, uh, for for joining us this evening. And um, I, I gather you're you're in Canada. That's where you're based these days. Yes, yes, I live out in Calgary, Alberta, in Western Canada. So right by the Rocky Mountains here. Um, I uh, left the UK uh, and the, and the BBC where I was working in in 2008 uh, to complete uh, my theological studies out here. I we've been coming to this area quite a bit, so. Uh, just came just to get away from things for a while, do my studies, a view to coming back in 2011. And then I got offered a position at a church here in Calgary and we've been here ever since. Fantastic. How are you adjusting to life? How, how was so adjusting to life? It's been a while, but how, how did it, how was yeah. the adjustment from life in the UK? It was tough. Uh, it was the hardest thing I had to do. You know, I mean, obviously uh, being a professional footballer is, is a tough career uh, to, to get there and then to stay there. And so I had 18 years there, then to carve out another career at the BBC, that was tough. But but coming here, emigrating with kids who were 15 and 12 at the time, uh, a total switch of fields, um, no football in my life for the for the first time, wow. uh, because Canada's all about hockey and uh, they don't you know they don't do much about soccer here. <laughs> um, and then I was obviously throwing myself into full time study. Um, and the climate here is harsh. You know, in the winter, it's, you know, we get minus 25, minus 30 degrees every day uh, from kind of November, December, all the way through to March. It's a, a long, hard winter. And so all of those things combined uh, have made it very challenging and yet very rewarding. Um, as I say, we have been here now, what will be 11, nearly 12 years, and my kids have grown and and they've married uh, here in Calgary, the married Canadians. And wow. so we've got more roots down here. So um, how, how has life in lockdown been? In some ways, similar to all, all you guys in the UK. In other ways, maybe a little different. Um, Canada's second largest country geographically in the world, but there's 33 million people in that in this country. So we're much more spread out. So a lot more space means a lot, lot less instances of, of COVID, uh, fortunately. Yeah. Um, uh, we haven't been on the restriction uh, that they have in the UK of, of like the one exercise per day. I know that's been lifted now, but we've been able to go out uh, as much as, as we wanted. Um, so it hasn't seemed to be quite so intense, I would say, mm -hmm. though everyone's still been affected. Shops have been closed, restaurants. Uh, they're predicting a 25% um uh, unemployment in, uh, in Calgary in the next year. So it's going to be a big, almost a depression out here, I think, for a while. Oh, well, um, oh. well, we, we pray for your safety and, and your health. And thank you for joining us tonight. I just want to say hello to a few people who've, uh, who've tuned in. So um, Mark Small's tuned in. He says, um, I've lost your comment there, Mark. He says, the Smalls are with you. Come on, you Spurs. Oops, sorry. Looking forward to tonight. <laughs> Apologies for Mr. Small there. And uh, Vicky, Vicky Smith, Nathaniel Freeman, Andrew Miller. And uh, there we are. Kathy Mallard, hello. Good evening to you. Louise Ingle, Janice Jones, that's my mother-in-law. Uh, what about Edgar Street? She's a Hereford United fan. So uh, there we are. Kath Tovey, welcome. Welcome. Jennifer Ann Davis. And uh, welcome. If you're tuning into Social Distancing tonight for the first time, we've got former Premier League footballer Gavin Peacock with us tonight. So if you've got any questions, please pop them in the comments section and we'll get them to him before um, it, the end of the programme. And uh, yeah, please uh, enjoy tonight's programme. So Gavin, I thought, um, I, I don't know about you, but um, lockdown, a lot of people, a lot of my friends have been sending me these requests to name your, your top 10 albums or your top 10 footballers, that sort of thing. And there's a lot of nostalgia flying around in the absence of live sport. Um, so I thought we'd a, a, a good way to, to tackle tonight would be uh, to look back at your career. And I've prepared some, some slides. I'm not a professional graphic artist by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I thought it'd be nice to, to go through the, the sort of through your career chronologically, if that was okay with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
So, um, so you started your career at Queens Park Rangers, nineteen eighty four, and mm. um, nineteen eighty four to nineteen eighty seven. And at the time, Queens Park Rangers were were, were top, weren't they? And I think in eighty four yeah. they were six points off winning the league. So, um, was that always a dream of yours to become a professional footballer? Yes, Rob. I mean, my dad Keith uh, was a professional for Charlton Athletic for seventeen years. Um, in fact, he's uh, made the most uh, appearances of any outfield player in Charlton's history. Um, his only goalkeeper, Sam Bartram, who made more appearances than my father. Um, so I grew up around the smell of a dressing room, going down to the valley, uh, watching the players train when I was on school holidays. And, and with my dad, who was one of those dads that, um, that encouraged me and coached me, but never pushed me. Uh, you know, saying I had to be a footballer. So I had the perfect kind of role model and example and coach. And yeah, I just wanted to live the schoolboy dream. I worked hard at school. I went to a, a, a grammar school and, and enjoyed my school days. But football was was my was my goal, literally. Um, I got into I went through the usual route of playing for the school, district, county. Mm-hmm. And then at 15, I played for England schoolboys. Um, so uh, I was in, you know, the team with Michael Thomas. Um, Michael Thomas ended up going to play for Arsenal in England. That that was my my era. Um, and a year later, I signed uh, for professional forms for QPR. Uh, left school uh, after I'd done my GCSEs, no A levels. Left at 16. And Terry Venables was the manager. That was one of the big reasons I wanted to sign because QPR weren't as big. I had other clubs like uh, Arsenal and Tottenham, uh, Liverpool wanted to sign me, but QPR wasn't as big, but they had Venables. They had the plastic pitch. It was the first, you know, plastic yeah. pitch in yeah. in top flight. And they kind of brought young players through the youth system really well. And um, so, yeah, I left school at 16 and, and I signed, got the schoolboy dream, signed for, for QPR. And, and this was around the time, um, if I've done my research correctly, that that you found your faith that you mm. became a Christian, you, so you've, you've re- realised that dream and then um, you went to a Methodist church with your mother, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Um, yeah, it was not long after I became a professional, about 18 months in. Um, you know, uh, being a professional footballer is everything the world tells you will make you happy. You know, it's the great career, you get your money, the fame, um, all of these things. Uh, and yet when I achieved it, and I had it because football was my God, if you like. If I played well, I was up. If I played bad, I was down. So I was up and down, up and down. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, this isn't really satisfying quite as I thought. So I was wrestling with that. And then I was living at home at the time. And just one night, my mum said, oh, I'm going to pop down to the local church a couple of hundred yards down the road. She wasn't a Christian, just going along to check it out. I said, I'll keep her company. And I went along that night and the minister said to me, um, after the service, I got a youth meeting back at my house after. Do you want to come along with people your own age there? So I pulled up that night in, the, in my XR3i, Ford XR3i, <laughs> nice 1980 sports car. Uh, had all, you know, I, I was in the in crowd. I had the money. I had the career. These half a dozen young people in that living room that night did not have what I had. But when they spoke about Jesus Christ and when they prayed, mm. there was a joy and a reality they had that I did not have. And then I began to hear the minister uh, unpacked from the Bible, what what is the gospel? And um, the gospel meaning good news. It's the good news of what God has done to to save people like me and you and everyone through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I realised that my biggest problem wasn't to get the approval of the crowd on the Saturday, but to be in a right relationship with the living God against whom I'd sinned, and yet because of His great mercy, had provided uh, salvation in Jesus. And yeah, I believed. And uh, um, and then everything changed because immediately uh, football wasn't God anymore. Jesus is God. And football then fell into its right place so that I could still enjoy football. Football's great. Sport, I always say, you know, f- football's great, but it isn't God. Um, and uh, and so I think, I, in fact, I actually became a better player because of it, because all of a sudden I had perspective that I didn't have. Uh, beforehand so yeah I was uh, I became a Christian at age 18 and I was pretty open with the guys in the dressing room uh, told them I I was a Christian and uh, and I went forth from there throughout my whole career virtually I was you know lived as a Christian sportsman wow and and, and, uh, back in those days I was watching the football show on Sky Sports the other day and they were talking about um, how how you you 
I think Matthew Letizia was saying he couldn't be open about any hobbies that he had because it was such a savage and brutal place in the dressing room. Did you find that yourself? I mean, when you, when you came to faith and yeah. going back into that environment, was it quite scary and daunting for you as a young lad? Well, you can imagine, like, Tiz is right. You know, that's another guy my era. We were in England youth set up together, me and the Tiz. Um, but he's brutal. I'll give you an example. You Anything new that you wear or take into the dressing room is is up for grabs with the lads. And I, I wore a new pair of, nice new pair of loafers to Chelsea training ground one day. And uh, Dennis Wise clocked them. When I came back in for training, they were full of orange juice, milk, <laughs> biscuits, uh, completely ruined. Uh, and I paid good money for those loafers. So you can imagine then going in and saying, oh, I'm a Christian uh, yeah. when I'm 18 as well. I'm not even an established first team uh, player, uh, 18 at QPR. Um, the lads were, there was a little bit of Mickey taking, but then after a while, they looked to see if it was genuine, if my kind of walk matched my talk. And, yeah. uh, but obviously I was by no means perfect at all. But they saw there was genuine faith there. And I, had, uh, after that and through my career, uh, amazing opportunities to speak to people. Uh, you never think play, certain players would ask about Jesus and what is the Christian faith. And I've had great opportunities to talk to them about that over my career. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely. And, and um, we've got some comments. I'd just like to draw them in. Um, yes, we've got a few Chelsea fans on, obviously. Um, and uh, Christopher Hayne, who is one such Chelsea fan, said he got saved at Loftus Road at a, at a Louis Palo mission in 1984. Um, wow. And um, there we go. We've got um, Mark was just alluding. Mark Small said, when did Gavin become a Christian? When was he a Christian while we playing? I think we just answered that one. Um, and there we are. Um, uh, Nathaniel Freeman from the Ronda, he's a regular on the programme, says Venables is local to me. And Gavin in the Ronda spent time up here during the war, I think. There you go. <laughs> and my, my dad is, is says, do you know anything of Reg and Grace's story? Bassano is close to Calgary. Um, there's a, if you don't, I will fill you in off air about that. It's quite an incredible story okay. um, of two, two um, missionaries uh, from your neck of the woods where you live at the moment. Um, so our special guest tonight is Gavin Peacock from a Premier League footballer. And uh, Gavin, we're going through your career. So after QPR, as a, as a young lad, you then went to Gillingham where your dad was the manager on loan and then you joined them for, I think it was £40,000. Yeah. Um, and then um, that was in the old third division, of course. Um, mm. What was it like working with your father? Was he a hero for you? Because obviously you grew up and for most lads, their dads are their heroes. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and my dad was and was the biggest influence. You know, I played for some great managers in my football career, but I still say my dad was the biggest influence. It was a strange thing that I ended up playing for my dad because I was an England under-19 international at QPR. I was in the first team, though I was in and out the first team. Um, I just signed not long before a new contract, but QPR were playing me uh, uh, as a striker or as a wide midfielder, and I really and I was in, I was a little bit impatient, impatience of youth as well. I wanted to be in that first yeah. team every week. And I wanted to play central midfield. Um, and I was living at home at the time still. And I came down for breakfast one morning. Now, by this time, my dad had been manager of Gillingham FC for six years. He'd been, you know, Steve Bruce had come through at Gillingham. My dad sold him on. And he obviously, he went on to great things. Tony Cascarino, another great player. He'd done very well with Gillingham. They just missed out on promotion to the old second division uh, the year before. And it was, uh, we were having breakfast one morning and, he looked across at me, he's looking thoughtful. He said, uh, got some injury problems in midfield. He said, uh, you wouldn't fancy coming on loan, would you, for a month? And uh, I was, uh, yeah, like, it was the right time. And I said, yes, Dad. He said, I'll speak to Jim Smith, who was then the manager at Gillingham, at, at QPR. My dad knew him from playing against him in the Oxford days when Jim, Jim was manager. Uh, he said, I'll speak to him, see if he'll let you come. Uh, and so the, the, the deal was done over a bowl of Weetabix, and I ended up being a Gillingham player for a month. And my dad, I really enjoyed being in the first team, week in, week out, uh, man's football, you know, down in that third division. It was tough, but I thought I'll carve myself. I wanted to be a goal-scoring midfielder. Hmm. I, I, I wanted to carve out games and, and get some consistency. And I, play, I ended up playing uh, 80 games, I think, in 18 months for Gillingham. Uh, 40,000 he bought me for, and Gillingham sold me for 250, which was a club record for Gillingham and for... Harry Redknapp at Bournemouth, who, who I went to Bournemouth uh, 
uh, and they were in the old second division, which is like the championship now. So I was starting, my gamble was to go down to come back up, but yeah. to come back yeah. up as an established player. So yeah, lo- love playing for my dad though. He didn't uh, do me any favours. He said, I'll, I'll underpraise you if anything, because I have to be careful. And we handled it rightly. Um, I don't mm-hmm. think there was a problem with the lads in the dressing room. Um, and I, I enjoyed playing for him. Amazing. Uh, with, with Harry Redknapp, um, was he out of, out of a car window saying he was going to sign you or something like that? <laughs> Almost. I think we met in a car park down in Bournemouth when I drove down with my dad. But again, see, the wonderful thing about having my dad with me was I didn't need an agent because yeah. my dad knew all the managers that I ever, you know, teams I played for. And, and it was easy for him to talk with them to do a deal. My dad wasn't going to stitch me up. It was going to be a fair deal. Um so when we went to meet Harry, actually, I think we did meet in the in the car park at Bournemouth Football Club. But then we drove to a hotel and he had young, a young, good looking kid in, in the seat in front. It was young Jamie Redner. Jamie was only 15 at the time. And within uh, a year, he'd got into the first team at Bournemouth. He was that good. So I played with Jamie right at the beginning. And then he'd gone to Liverpool within six months after that. Incredible, incredible. And, uh, of course, a big move. Not a lot. You weren't at Bournemouth very long, were you? And then um, the tune came calling, Newcastle United. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember the day because Harry was on his phone in training. And, you know, Harry, he's always doing a deal on on the uh, player or maybe, maybe he's having a bet on the dogs. I don't know. But um, <laughs> he came over to me after training. He said, Gavin, Newcastle United have come in for you. Um, do you fancy going? And I knew then and there I'm gonna, I was going to go as a sign. And my wife and I, we'd only been married a year. We got married, moved down to the south coast, and beautiful, you know, Bournemouth's lovely, isn't it? Um, she, we just got our first little three bed semi detached house and got it all nice. And I went home and I said to Amanda, I said, uh, Newcastle United have come in for me. and I said, oh, we've got to go. And she just burst into tears, looked around the house and said, where's Newcastle? I said, it's up north and it's cold, but it's a great opportunity. And and uh, my granddad, that's my dad's dad, yeah. was a Geordie. Yeah. So all my dad's side of the family, Geordie. So for me, it was like almost like going home. I love my time on Tyneside. They're, they're a special, special club, aren't they? I've been to Newcastle and it just... I'm from Wales, of course, and everything here is Welsh rugby. And you go to Newcastle, yeah. it's the same sort of thing. It's like they're the national team of that area. It's it's huge, yeah. absolutely huge. And and at Newcastle, of course, you you helped save the club from relegation in ninety one, ninety two, and and that yeah. was quite fraught, wasn't it, for the club? The last day of the season against Leicester, who were promoted or going for promotion, and Kevin yeah. Keegan had come in, and, and you had to you scored in that game, didn't you, to try and keep the club up? Yes, yeah. I mean, we'd had a Newcastle was a sleeping giant. Aussie Adilas came in and brought some good young players through, but we were defensively not so good. Then we were fighting against relegation. Kevin Keegan came in and he said, "We'll survive my, this first season, then we'll take off." Of course, it went to the wire at Leicester, at Filbert Street, and uh, I scored the first goal. They equalised late on, and then it was a last-minute own goal uh, that Steve Walsh put in the back of his neck. And we stayed up um, and, and then we just took off the next year, the promotion year uh, under Kevin Keane. And, and um, you, you, yeah, as I said, you played a key part. You won the title, um, played some fantastic stuff. Um, yeah. What um, Were you sad to leave Newcastle because you, you then went to the Chelsea, didn't you, straight after that? Yeah. No, as I say, I love playing for Newcastle. Uh, to get promotion in that season, we did play some of the best football, if not the best I've ever played with the team uh, for those fans, like you said, Rob, you know, special fans working. I think where you get, you have a working class area where, you know, the people are pretty down to earth. They work hard for their pound note and they, they just want to see their team give everything and entertain them on the set, lift them out of the doldrums almost. And that's what it was like to play for Newcastle. So special relationship. And then, yeah, we got promotion. I had signed a new contract, but uh, my wife gave birth to her first child right after the end of the season. And um, it was a very difficult labor, 48 hour labor. Mm. And our boy Jake was born and he was born without his right hand. So it was, and it was a shock because we only had one scan in those days and it might have been the way he was lying in in the scan, but he didn't show up. So we had this traumatic labor and then the birth and just see as a boy or a girl, saw as a boy, but then he cried and like half his arm was missing. So it was such a, 
you can imagine that. I just got promoted. I'm at the yeah. peak of my yeah. physical powers. And then all of a sudden, it's all turned upside down. And we don't know what's wrong, if there are other things wrong. Um, at that moment, I could have cared less whether I played football again. Yeah. Um, but our faith is strong. And, you know, we understood that God is good and he's still in control, even when we don't understand certain things that happen to us in our life, in this life with the sufferings that everybody faces mm. but and to different degrees. Um and yet, at that time, it was our first baby, and we we were from the southeast of England. Amanda's mum was down there, and we were just, she wanted to get back close to the, her mum. And I spoke to Kevin Keegan, and he said, look, I've got Beardsley coming in. I think you, Andy Cole, and Lee Clark have played great with Beardsley. But if you're not happy in families-wise, you won't play your best football. I won't outprice you in the market. And within a month, Hoddle got the Chelsea job and he made me his first big sign, 1.25 million. Wow. And so I left Tyneside with, it was bittersweet really, because mm. mm. it was a great time to finish. And yet the sadness of leaving because of the birth circumstances, but also the sadness of leaving Newcastle, where I would have probably stayed on had that not happened. And yet I was going to a great club in Chelsea. Sure, sure. And um, we've got a question, and I, I know we are we are we've pressed for time, so I do want to ask, get these questions to you. Jonathan Lloyd says, my son uh, is starting his career as a professional rugby player. What advice would you give to him as a young Christian man? And he's and he's he started his career already as a, yes, as a pro. he started yeah. his career, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great question. I mean, you know, professional sport is it, a tough world. I would say that um, that he needs to be in a good church, um, he needs to be in the Word, in the Bible, and, and prayer daily, so good spiritual life daily, um, and he needs to have good mentors around him, to have good men around him, good Christian men that can speak into his life, keep him grounded, that he can confide in, you know, this, this, the spiritual aspect that, uh, that he'll be facing on and off the field. Um, he needs good men around him. So those three things, good church, disciplined spiritual life and, and and good male mentors around him in particular brilliant thank you gavin and thank you jonathan for that question our special guest tonight gavin peacock former professional footballer bbc pundit and now minister in canada and uh, gavin i just want to we, we, we i'm just conscious of time so i just want to uh, get through um the rest of your career <laughs> sorry um <laughs> but it does go by in a flash so they say um yes. so um yeah so after after Newcastle, of course, you, you joined Chelsea, and, and this is where things start to take off. So, 93-94, you score the only goals as Chelsea beat Manchester United home and away in the Premier League. And just to put that into context, they only lost four games in the league that season, and you beat them twice. Uh, that must have been some 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 moment for you, um, scoring the winner at Old Trafford against such a great team, and, and also at Stamford Bridge early on in the season. Yeah, the bridge, the, the goal at the bridge, obviously, I was early on in my Chelsea career. So uh, I scored on my debut, but to score the winner against United, that was uh, that really sort of secured me with the Chelsea fans. And they had a Cantona in their team and gigs and all these great players. Um, but then to do it up at Old Trafford and we're going up there, it was a covert operation. Uh, we're going to get in, get the win and get out. And, <laughs> it's a, you know, the theatre of dreams, it's intimidating. Um, but it, Glenn Hoddle just said, well, we're going to be tight. We'll take care of their wingers, uh, Giggs and Kanchelskas, and we'll play for a counter-attack. And uh, he said you, to me, you might get one opportunity in the game. You've got to put it away. And it, I did. And I did. <laughs> I got one opportunity. It went the ball out wide into Mark Steen, edge of the box. He nodded it down. I saw the gap appearing. And then it's me and Schmeichel. And as he's come out, I knew I'd get there first, just lift it over him. And, and I watched the ball bounce into the back of the net. And our, our Chelsea fans were right down there in that corner. And, uh, yeah, what, what a moment. We survived. They were on top of us, pummeling us. But we got the double. And uh, so that was a great first season for, for Chelsea in, in particular. And, and also, of course, you, you scored six goals in the FA Cup run to the final, including both goals in the semi-final against Luton at Wembley. That must have been amazing yeah. again. Um, what what In terms of scoring a goal, um, I've heard various professionals say over the years what it, the feeling you get when you score a goal. What is it like for you, especially as a Christian, and, and I've heard you talk on this before, you said that it's, you get such joy from it, but that's you equate that it's from God, you say, the, the joy. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I, I, how you want, how, I mean, all skill 
is a gift from God. So, you know, whatever skills we have in life and whatever we, we're given, it's a gift from God. And so we called them to work and use the, our skills to the best of our ability, whatever walk of life we're in. Um, so that gives us everybody great purpose in their work, whether you're kind of, you know, sweeping streets, maybe a bit more mundane, or you're scoring goals at, uh, against Manchester United. It's still using your gifts to the best of your ability for, for God's glory. Mm. Um, and when you see it like that, and it's not so self-centered, there's a pleasure you get uh, in doing it. And uh, maybe it's better expressed in the words attributed to Eric Liddell, who uh, from that film Chariots of Fire made famous as the great Scottish rugby player who became Olympic champion runner who ended up being a missionary and dying in a prisoner of war camp uh, in, in China in the war. Um, he said, uh, he said, God made me for a purpose. And that purpose was China. So he was to go to China and he was going to take the gospel to China as a missionary. He said, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Uh, you know, not to run would be to dishonor him. And I think that's what I, the way I would describe it. You know, when God made me, made me for a purpose. I was a Christian man. And ultimately, I'm, you know, an hour pastor in the church. But he also made me a professional footballer for a while. And, and when I scored, I felt the pleasure of God, even as the crowd roared. So that's maybe a good way of putting it. Thank you. And I'm just conscious of time. So, um I, I, of course, you went on to play in the FA Cup final that year, hit the bar just before half time, and me and my friends were all rooting for you because we hate Man United. So, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people were doing that. In fact, Nathaniel says two teams I support Cardiff City and whoever's playing Man United. <laughs> so, you've just gone up in my eyes, he says. There you go. Um, in, in terms of, um, in terms of sort of the, the, the football career you had, and, and you've alluded to it there, you know, that the, the the purpose and plan that we have. And in Jeremiah, of course, it says that God has a, a perfect plan and purpose for us. Um, you went on to, to work at such a top level as a lot of people tuning in tonight will know you from. You work with the BBC on, on the BBC Sports and they used to enjoy your punditry there. And now, of course, you're a minister in Canada. A lot of people get wrapped up in their identity um, yeah. as the job that they're doing. So for me, uh, during my career, when I was a journalist, I was Rob, I'm a BBC journalist. That was my... I, I'm yep. wrong sadly i'm 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 not ashamed oh, i am ashamed to admit it but i'm honest enough to admit that that became part of who i was for sometimes but actually my identity is actually a christian so what advice would you give to people who sort of it's easy to get wrapped up into that isn't it i do music at the moment so i can say yeah i'm a, I'm a worship artist or whatever and things like that but but actually it's not i'm a christian first and foremost is that how you cope with the transition from lucrative career to lucrative career where perhaps other ex pros struggle after they finish yeah oh definitely and and it's for everybody you know is that you know we are the bible tells us we're created by god in the image of god male or female um for god and that's our fundamental identity um, and then uh, it, as you become a Christian, um, your identity is found as Christian in Christ first. And that can't be taken away from you. Once you find your identity, and the whole world's looking for identity. The whole world's running around placing their identity in this, that and the other. And of course, it will always ultimately disappoint because nothing lasts yeah. forever. Um, isn't the COVID crisis proving that? You want to put your identity and trust in your money. Well, look at the stock market, see how that's doing. You want to uh, put it in your health because you're so fit and strong. Well, look we're faced more than ever with with death and illness around us and, and that's bringing home our own fragility what about friends and and family i've got so much popularity where you can't really see anyone too much at the moment so yeah. all of these yeah. things are temporary but but jesus christ is eternal and we find our identity in him as being image bearers of god to be, to live for god in obedience to him once you got that right everything else begins to fall into position so then i was first a christian but a Christian footballer. Football's gone, still a Christian. Mm. Now I've defined my way in a new career. I had to start from the bottom at the BBC, work up, uh, became very, it was very successful, but I was a Christian broadcaster, not, so then that was easy to then, let, not easy to lay aside, it still hurts, but then I move on. And even now, I'm a pastor, but my identity's not tied up in being a pastor. It, I'm a Christian. And uh, I might not be a pastor in two or three years. Something may happen or maybe in another walk of life. So um, that's the great thing uh, that being a Christian gives you. It gives you your fundamental identity 
fundamental hope and purpose. And where there's so much talk in, in the game of football and in general about mental health issues, and I know plenty of people struggle with these things, um, Christianity, uh, being a follower of Jesus Christ, is your uh, first step in regaining a, a, a right perspective. And it really does address issues that, uh, of mental health as well, uh, where we get stressed out a bit, this, that, the other, inordinately. And I deal with a lot of that in my ministry now even. Gavin, um, we're, we're out of time, sadly. Um, could listen to you all night. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to us on Social Distancing Live. And um, I just wondered if I, if I could just ask you, if people are tuning in tonight and uh, they've stumbled across the programme, they're interested in football, and that's why they thought they were tuning in for, yeah. what, what is the hope and the peace that you have as a Christian? And what would you say to them if, if they're, they're interested this evening? Yeah, well, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. Football is a great game. It's the best, in my opinion. Uh, but, but, but football doesn't last forever. Football points towards things that we really desire, an identity, to be identified with a club, uh, the hope of being thrilled with glorious things. You know, we come to the stadium on a Saturday to worship even together, like, but we worship the players. Um, so, but we were made to worship God. We were made to have identity in him. We were made to see glory uh, and be thrilled by him. And so that all the things that you even like about sport find their ultimate uh, goal in Jesus Christ. And, and the Bible says that God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, and it doesn't matter, I mean, you know, here tonight for the first time hearing it, whoever believes in him shall not perish because um, we all deserve judgment and we will all die one day, but have eternal life. And that's the greatest hope because you, you know you've, your best life is yet to come, uh, makes the difficult times in this life bearable uh, and brings everything its right perspective. Gavin Peacock, thank you very much indeed. And uh, God bless you and your family and, uh, and all that you do in Canada. Thank you for being our guest tonight. God bless you greatly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rob. Cheers. Thank You Jesus was written very late one night in the dining room of my end of terrace house in Swansea. I returned home following a late shift and felt compelled to pick up my guitar and worship. I remember trying to play and sing as quietly as I could, not to wake up my baby son who was sleeping upstairs. The whole song, the melody, the structure came out in one constant stream. I even knew what the lyrics were going to be about. The message of the cross and the hope available to everyone because of what Jesus did for us. Having an attitude of gratitude can transform our mood and mental state, and being thankful is at the heart of worship. I hope that Thank You Jesus makes people think about what Jesus did for them, but also helps them to express their heart back to him as the penny drops of the lengths that he went to to be with us. It's like a mission moment, yeah? You get to see.
Hello and uh, welcome back to Social Distancing Live. Our special guest, Gavin Peacock, their former Chelsea, Newcastle, Charlton, QPR, AFC Bournemouth and Gillingham um, midfielder and now pastor at a church in Calgary in Canada. Um, absolutely fantastic to have Gavin on and so fascinating to hear his story. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of um, football fanatic myself, it was just great to talk football as well because I, I do miss football. And uh, I, I don't know what, what you miss during this lockdown, but that's one of the things I do miss is, is live sport and um, fantastic. And listening to that is, is a very good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Pete Jones, or Pastor Pete Jones, I should say, uh, from Elevate Church near Abtaleri. Pete, welcome to Social Distancing Live. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's been a, a, a long, good, ongoing relationship that we've had over months and months and, and uh, tune in to most nights. Uh, to see that it's just been getting better and better and the audience has been building. It's such a privilege to be on here. So thank you so much for asking me. No problem at all. No problem at all. And, and um, so Elevate Church. Um, so let me let me just paint the picture for, for our viewers. Is <laughs> It's next door to a, an awesome soft play centre that you run. And, yeah. um, and it's in the South Wales Valleys there. But you meet as a church on a Saturday night and you've not been going for that long, have you? No, uh, in fact, we're just coming up to a year um, with us being open. Um, yeah, we were in a very, you know, we we decided to do things a little different. Of course, we're having church in a in a soft play centre, so that's very different. Uh, but if, you know, we've chosen to do church on a sat on a Saturday evening. Uh, that's been a that was a major strategic plan for us for how the church was planted and how it was going to be run. Um, mainly because when we were, you know, as, as I've been brought up in church all my life, um, actively going to church on a Sunday and going through, um, um, leadership in churches, you see that, you know, we are there as a church to support families all the way through. And, and so often as they get a little bit, so often as the families grow a little bit older, the children grow older, um, they end up getting involved in, in, in some sport and activities as some sports we just heard about. Um, and sometimes because of the sports, it means that they can't attend church on a Sunday because of the sports. So that's why we ended up doing church on a Saturday night. Sure. And, and of course, life, life and, um, and, and things change. Don't they work patterns change. Like traditionally people used to have sort of shift work, nine to five work, Monday to Friday, et cetera, et cetera. But, but life over the last, 20 30 years has changed quite dramatically um in in that sort of regard and i suppose for some people it's more convenient to have it on a saturday night yeah i think work life balance is always um is always a conversation that we're willing to have and uh, and in fact last night as we were uh, of course we're social distancing and, and we're talking about zoom right now and stuff you know with our church last night we were discussing about how things are changing and and how um you know, the future can change and looks like it's going to be changing and, and how how are we are going to cope with that ourselves? How, how are we going to adapt to that and how will that affect us? Great. Well, if you've just tuned into Social Distancing Live, our second special guest of the evening is Pastor Pete <laughs> Jones, my good friend from Elevate Church. Um, near Abtaleri, it's Aberbeek, is that correct, Aberbeek? I just want to get... It is Aberbeek, yeah. Aberbeek, yeah. there you yeah. go. And um, yeah, so... Earlier on, we had a uh, former professional footballer, Gavin Peacock, and uh, Pete, you were listening to that. Um, what did you think of, of the of the interview with Gavin? What did you think? What, what, what did you pick up on? Yeah, so hand on my heart, um, I am not a a, uh, a follower of football by any stretch of the imagination at all. So for me to uh, listen to somebody's story about how they've gone from club to club to club um, and how they've supported that and how he stepped in and stepped up into different locations... Um, but to see the thread that God has had throughout his whole career and now as as he leads a church uh, doing what he's called to do is just incredible. I think we're just blown. I was just blown away listening to that testimony. And, and it's interesting what he said about identity, isn't it? Because a lot of ex-professional footballers, and I know that you do some chaplaincy work with sports people as well. They struggle at the end of their career because it's such a short time frame. Um, of course, the identity is wrapped up in that, the footballer so-and-so, you know, the rugby player so-and-so. And, and, and of course, as Christians, our identity is that we are Christians. We're not a pastor. We're not a worship leader. That's our first identity. That's that's the basis of it all. But it can Absolutely. so easily be, it can be quite 
you know, it's it's quite natural for it to be, get wrapped up into something else because that's how people describe us. Yeah, I think we can be. Um, you know, if people want to put badges on us because it's nice and easy for them to put us into boxes of okay, this is Pete. He's the pastor of Elevate Church, or this is Pete. He's the you know he he's a drummer, um, or he's and they they put you into boxes. Well, those things are the other are, are what you do. They are, they don't define who you are, and it's the giftings that God has given you are the things that define you. And when you stand upon the rock that God has given you, and you stand up for what you believe is right, and you stand up with integrity, and you're honest, and you have all those things, I totally believe. Just like just like um, Gavin was just saying there, when you stand up for what's right, and you do the right thing, and you you go into places that maybe you didn't see yourself getting there, but God has already been there before you and he already steps in and he knows where you're going. I love that. Awesome. We've got some um, people you might know uh, tuning in tonight. So um, there we are. So um, there we are. Maureen McKay. Maureen McKay says, great how the church is advancing, catering for families. Um, Jonathan Lloyd says, ask Peter about the offside rule. I'm not going <laughs> to... I'm not going to do that. I've got absolutely no idea. Um, I'm not even going to even attempt to even describe it to you. So next question. No, I think a lot of football fans are in the same boat, so we'll worry about that. Um, Joy Jenkins says, love Elevate Church. Sharon Davis, me too, Joy Jenkins. So a lot of love for Elevate Church. If you've got a, a question for Pastor Pete Jones here tonight from Elevate Church, please, please, please um, ping it in the comments. We'll get it to him. And um, um, and Pete, so tell us a bit about how lockdown's been affecting the church, because obviously, um, but before you do that, though, when you launched uh, not so long ago, you, you've had seen some rapid growth, haven't you? Yeah, so it's been um, off, not even a year yet since we've opened um, the church to say, you know, to say that we started with a bang was a little bit of an understatement. And from there on in, we've just continued to grow. So the, the, the church is is grown substantially and um yes we haven't had church for the last goodness me eight nine ten weeks it seems to be a bit of a blur at this moment in time um how long we've been apart physically but yet actually online stuff has, has changed an awful lot so the amount of people that are interacting with us online on a saturday night that's grown um we're really encouraged by all the stuff that's going online and and, you know, there's various different social media platforms that we're using for that. It's been great. Yeah. And, and you, 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 ever since I've known you, you're all, you always struck me as, as an entrepreneur type person, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. All the different, you know, from the Eden Center to the Churchway setup, you're always thinking outside the box. So, so this sort of lockdown scenario is perfect for someone like you, isn't it? With thinking outside the box and how you do church in lockdown. Yeah, I mean, it's given me lots of, um, um, it's not very often that I, you know, I I tend to have a huge amount of time to myself to think about what the next season is. And um, uh, I said last night, and I, and I know that some people are really struggling with the place of where, of what we're in right now, and I, and I understand that completely. But for me personally, um, I am finding this has been a really blessed season that I'm in. And I'm saying that it's blessed because I'm able to take time out, time away from everything else that we would normally do, and to strategically look at how the future is going to be. What are we going to implement? How are we going to do things differently? How can we run things successfully that it's just not a bang and it's created, but yet there's longevity in what we do. And yet everything that we do has to come from a heart of making a difference. And how do we make that difference? How do we impact the communities? the people around us, the families around us? How do we grow character and how do we implement all of those things that that, that we believe that God has given us for a, a, a hungry heart to want to make a difference for? Sure. And and, and like you said, there, there are people struggling and I know a lot of you who tune in regularly to Social Distance in Life say that you appreciate this broadcast um, during this time. And how do you see things coming out of um, lockdown, Peter? How, how, are you, how are you thinking at the moment with everything? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, lots of, um, I even asked this question last night um, because I can see um, that there are challenging times ahead. And I think that the challenging times ahead are 
you know, let, let's not let's not hide behind. Um, you know, I've struggled myself with being locked away because I'm used to being around people, um, and people will struggle coming out of this with mental health problems, with issues about self confidence, self awareness. How are we gonna? How is the church gonna be best suited, and in a in a best supporting role? maybe a signpost to whoever that they need to go and see. What are we going to be doing that's going to be helping, supporting, encouraging, and all of those things that the church needs to be. And the church needs to be something that is alive and living and not something that is caught on its back feet, worried about what are we going to do, but knows about the actions that it's going to be taken to, okay, we've already thought about this, and the, this, is, this is the people that you can go, or these are the people you can go and see, for this particular situation that you find yourself in. So we really just want to help people. And um, I know during during lockdown, um, you're very community focused, aren't you? Um, I know we, you know about Gateway and the, the meal service that Gateway Church and Abergavenny has been running. What have you been doing at Elevate? And, and also with the live streams at Gateway, they've gone through the roof. We've got thousands of people tuning in. Have you seen a similar sort of thing with your streams as well, where more people are engaging with your content and things like that? Yeah, we have, yeah. So... Um, I think because our church is on a Saturday night, um, it's a little bit unique, really. Um, I enjoy on a Sunday. I do a little bit of church hopping on a Sunday uh, because I'm not, uh, of course, I'm not preaching and we've got no church on a Sunday. Uh, because churches are now online on Facebook or whatever they want, we're able to tune into different different churches and to have a listen from many different angles um, that I enjoy listening to. So for that for that aspect, I've enjoyed it. Um, if I look at the the aspect of church growth personally for Elevate Church, Facebook. Um, when we started Elevate Church, we were adamant that we were never going to do an online presence of church. There was a reason for this, um, because I believe that when a person has a um, a real bet. A real revelation of who God is. That is a a personal um, walk that they are having with God, and therefore, I don't think it's appropriate for cameras to be on those people at that time. So um, we made a call of saying from the outset that we weren't going to be doing that, uh, but we were going to be protecting people, protecting what what went on personally for them. But we had to be engaged in a way that that uh, we were relevant. So, for instance, we started to use podcasts uh, and things like that. So they, they were growing. They were doing really well. Um, but, of course, lockdown came, and it was a – my let's just say it was a forced hand. Uh, we had to make some decisions about what we were going to do and how we were going to do church. And for us, it was never about how we do church for how do we, how do we grow big church. It was never about that. It was – about how do we build authentic church where people see the real deal, mm. whereby it's not something that they can look at and go, um, that church is a big, big church with all the single, with all of that. It wasn't about that. It was about how can we be authentic in the way that we are so that people will engage with us. And then after that, because of that authenticity that we have, we're able to grow the church on a social media platform. And then hopefully when the time is right, we can corporately gather together and therefore the church will be enlarging with us. So we've had many, I've had personally many a conversation with people saying, I love your church. I love what you do. Thank you so much. I can't wait to be with you. And those conversations have come with people that haven't set foot in churches for 25 years. Wow. And man, I am so looking forward to seeing those people face to face, grabbing a coffee, sitting down and building relationship. I really am looking forward to that. Yeah, I've had enough of lockdown now. I've got to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it's doing my head in. <laughs> I've even lost my hair, Pete. Is it, is it good I think it looks fantastic. Uh, we, we spoke earlier. I thought you looked beautiful. So please don't worry. <laughs> I thought you just did it for me. It was okay. <laughs> 
Oh, amazing. Well, um, tonight's special guest was Gavin Peacock, professional footballer uh, of Chelsea, Newcastle, and now a minister in Canada. And we've also got another special guest, my good friend Pete Jones, Pastor Pete Jones from Elevate Church in the South Wales Valleys. And, and Pete, um, we're going to take a song. And uh, if you've got any questions for Pete um, while we play this next song, please, please, please pop them in the comments and reactions section. We'll get them to him um, straight away. But this song is called Overflow. darkest times I will not fear for you are with me walking by my side I know that you are near There you go. That was Overflow there um, by my good self, um, and uh, which is available on my website. <laughs> Please keep your roof over my head. <laughs> I'm only joking. Uh, I'm Rob Westall. This is Social Distance in Live, and we've got Pastor Pete Jones from Elevate Church with us this evening. Um, Pete, um, we've got a comment here. Luciana Brace says, as Pastor Pete says, the best is yet to come. I gather that you, you sign off a lot of your 
your sermons at Elevate Church with that catchphrase. But there's a lot of people tuning in tonight. Um, my, you know, myself included, I've had some moments during lockdown. Um, as, as Gavin Peacock, our guest earlier, said, you know, some people have their faith in football. They worship the players and, and live sports gone. And some people have stocks and shares. And, and you know, there's uns- great uncertainty about finance. Some people are fit and healthy. And, I mean, that's all up in the air with, with COVID-19. And we don't know who how people react to it in different ways. And, and there's lots of uncertainty in the air there's lots of fear in the air and uh, a lot of people tuning in might be feeling that um so you say the best is yet to come but i know that you've got a, a personal testimony yourself of where you had a decision to make about which way you could go and uh, we can either react to things of course or we can we can choose to do different things so so what if you would share leave us with a message of encouragement and hope really yeah i'd love to so um just by you saying that i'm i'm reminded of uh Sometime, I, if I rewind uh, back some years, I'm, and I'm thinking maybe it's about 18, 18, 15, 18 years ago, um, I was playing, uh, I, so my hobby was playing drums, and I've always had this aspiration that I was going to be this this player that was going to be traveling the world and doing all those things and being being in a band and playing on stage with, you know, all those things. and And... Um, I had, you know, I guess with every musician, you have those dreams and, and your hopes and aspirations. And and I was one of those. I certainly had those dreams. I, I had those hopes. And um, I was lucky enough to be in a band. And we were, uh, this band um, was practicing in Cardiff, in a recording studio in Cardiff uh, every week. And... Uh, without doubt, this uh, the band that I was in was was of course from where I lived. There was a, a considerable journey. Um, plus, I was working shifts at the time, and and family life uh, was was challenging. I was recently married, and uh, and, and I, there was a baby on the way. So, I guess that's the pic- the, the picture that was painted was that. I, I was an engineer, I was in a job and, and working, working 12 hour shifts and my hobby was playing the drums but believed that they were so much more than this. And as I was playing in this band back and forth and this band got even more professional and, and media started, they started to have some media attention and they were signed, they ended up being signed. And um, I can remember going into a band, uh, going into the studio on one particular week. And uh, the guys were, were uh, let's say, smoking some stuff that we may not partake of. And, uh, and they were, they were uh, indulging themselves in that. Well, of course, I was drumming, being in, inside a closed room, um, things you know, obviously I was inhaling that at the same time. Now, I can remember the, the picture was this really clearly. I was driving, so after band rehearsal, put the stuff away and uh, I was driving home, pitch black at night and, and uh, I can remember being on the home, uh, on, the, on the, the Visca bypass. There was no one else around me. There was no other cars and I was just, the blur, it was just a white line in the road and it just became a blur. And it was as if a voice just spoke to me. And I, I can clearly remember it to this day. And it was, do you really want to do this? Is this really the path that you want to go down? And the question that it led me to think of was, should I be doing this? Is this really what God's got for me? And even though I loved drumming and I loved the thought of what that was going to bring me, The realization was that I could have been dragged into a world that I, it would, yes, I would have got the accolade to go with the the drum and I could have got all of those things, but yet the knock on effect could have been very great for me and my family. And was it what God really wanted for me? Was that? And at that time, I had to make a choice. And for me, my, uh, and, and the band used to laugh at me all the time because, my heart is that I love worship music. It was never about the, it was never about the, 
the big um, wow wow pedals and and the screaming sounds and all. It was never about that. It was always about um, um, worship and how do we lead people into worship? How do you do worship music that people can relate to, that they can listen to, that they can get that almost that that you're able to unzip um, heaven and that heaven can come down and invade somebody's life. How does that work? How can that develop? How can how can I be a part of that with helping to facilitate how people can get um, drawn in to maybe having a relationship with God? How can that happen? So those things went on and, and I had to make a tough call. And the call was I left the band. And man, just the week after I left the band or so, they ended up going to America and touring. And yeah, I was frustrated. Yes, I was down. But I totally believe that God was in the was in the detail. Mm. And I still believe it to this day that um, some of those, you know, the band is is now not going on. And and but from that, people know and my friends know around me that my heart is worship. And I love, 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 love listening to worship music. I love playing to worship music. And if by any stretch that the we can we can facilitate so that a person can listen to a song and God can invade their life because of that, then that's just just awesome. So we all have choices to make in life, and I, what what I picked up on then was, um, you know, you. I, I know for a fact, I I can totally relate to what you were saying there that you're in a band and they've gone to America and you've decided to leave because you think that's right. What God's saying, but you are gutted at the same time because you know, that that was part of your dream. And sometimes it's painful to let go what your dream is, but God's got a better plan for you and a better purpose for you. And, and actually one, one of the lines in a song I wrote was, um, you know, that God knows us better than I know myself. He knows me better. You know me better than I know myself. And, that took a bit of get into that that lyric and um because sometimes we think we know best we th- we've known ourselves all our lives to if that makes sense yeah. and uh yeah oh, i like this i like that that's my gift and that's my talent i should be doing this i should be doing that but actually god's above it all and it's, if you think liken it to like we're in a maze and we can just see a brick wall in front of us you can see the route yeah. around it so yeah. um so so it, it seemed like what you were saying there that that God definitely had a plan and purpose for you that you couldn't see at the time, but you just knew that you had to take that step. And yeah, absolutely. And and I know that you know I'm my journey is is not uh, is is not unique. That God is only speaking to me because God talks to every one of us. And and the plan and the purpose that He has for us, for each and every one of us, is unique for ourselves. And um, the story is being written. And we just need to catch up to to where God wants to take us. And and I believe wholeheartedly that as I said and as you mentioned that the best is yet to come because if the more that we follow God the more that we the more that we um, tune into his voice the more that we um, accept and go okay God I wasn't planning on doing this but I'm, I'm gonna go down this route no matter how no matter where but I'm, I'm just gonna run with it the minute that we do that it's almost like God gets an accelerator behind us and, and we we go and God just opened doors and, and because of that, um, I just believe that he blesses us as we step the path that the, uh, that the path that God has for us. Brilliant. Pete, thank you for coming on tonight on Social Distance in Live. And um, it, what would you say to people who tune in tonight who don't have that plan and purpose figured out that um, perhaps don't have the faith we have or perhaps did have it, but don't anymore? Um, what would you say to them if they're tuning in tonight? Yeah, sure. So. For me, it's really simple that um, we've mentioned tonight about maybe what our badge is, who we are and what, you know, what do other people perceive of us tonight? um, I just want to say to those people that no matter who we are, that your imprint that you have is unique to you and God has given you that and your thumbprint Your DNA is unique to you and God has made you to be you. And he doesn't want you to be anyone else or to copy anyone else, but he wants you to be you. So for you to be you means 
that you are being you because of who God has made you to be. And if you can accept who you are because of the way that God has made you, man, that is half of the battle. Because the minute that you do that, you're then saying, God, I accept who I am and I'm willing to go on that journey, on that path. I'm willing to step into all that you've got for me. And I'm willing just to walk the walk. Uh, I may not know the talk, but I'm willing just to walk the walk. Pete, thank you so much, mate. Thank you so much indeed. So if that's you this evening, if any of what Pete or Gavin, Gavin Peacock has said, has connected with you in any way, then we would love to talk to you about that. And I know that um, Pastor Pete would love to take your questions as well. And uh, you can contact me and I can put you in touch with him as well. But but if, if any of that connected with you, it's no accident that you've tuned in this evening. And uh, it's, it's no accident that you watch, perhaps rewatching this after we've gone live. Um, it's, it's meant to be and do not delay. Time is now. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but um, you can have all that God's got for you. You can have that perfect plan and purpose and that fulfillment of life. You know, so much of my life, I've been obsessed with fulfilling my potential, but that only comes through my identity as a child of God, as a Christian and following what his plan and purpose is for me because he knows me better than I know myself. And he has the best for me and he has the best for you too. So don't delay. Please get in touch. God bless you. I pray for um, provision for your family, perfect health, just over you, your family and friends. And uh, God bless you. Stay safe. Be kind. And uh, tune in tomorrow night. We've got a special show tomorrow night. We've got Camille Meskill from The Light Room revealing their new single, their electronic dance music single, live on the program, sharing some of her incredible story with us. But for now, if that's you, if any of tonight is connected with you in any way, it's something that Gavin Peacock said, something that Pastor Pete said, something that I said then please, please, please get in touch. And there's a song that we're going to play now that you can sing along to and respond to and say in your own words to God because at the end of the day, it's between you and him, not you, me and him. God bless you all. to you show us your glory show us your glory let your kingdom come we're on our knees We turn to you, we lay our lives down, we're laying our lives down, let your will be done. Your will be done as we bow before you.
crying out to you. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let your kingdom come. Thank、you